importance of why everybody should not just think about traveling locally, which of course is very important, but also traveling globally. No. Um, if you guys, at the end of the presentation, I brought a table full of books. Guys, I've learned the importance of technology. I literally carried eight of these books in my pack with me for three months across Europe. And boy, did that get heavy. So <laughs> I learned um, that while having small technology, I carried my little iPhone 3D with me. Uh, next time, there will be an iPad or some sort of notebook. Uh, I attempted to keep a blog. Um, not very fun trying to type on this little keyboard. <laughs> so, uh, learned my lessons. Um, you're going to make the, this is going to seem like a sales pitch for the Rick Steves company. He is my travel guru. I'm going to talk about him a little more. Um, but yes, some people have commented on my little glamour shot here. This is me in front of the Eiffel Tower. And my mom might contradict me, but I'm saying when I was about 10 years old, I, for some reason I fell in love with Europe, the idea of Paris, the idea of the Eiffel Tower. And it just kind of beckoned me. I don't know why. I wish I could remember the key element of what, what it was about Paris. But my teenage years, I decided I'm going to go. I started saving. I started working and I started saving and due to a mother's love who said, I want you to go, but I don't want you to go without me, or without, I'm sorry, not with her. <laughs> <laughs> I want you to go with a friend. Tra don't travel alone. So I had this idea that, okay, well, I'm going to travel. I should travel with, uh, um, with a friend. And unfortunately, at 16, 17, 18 years old, most kids don't think about saving money to travel abroad. So instead, I go off to college my first time. Wasn't quite a success, but that's why I'm here now. Um, and uh, I got married, and I married somebody who would not get on a plane. So my passion for travel never subsided. And what we did is we got into our car, and we traveled all over this country. Three different trips. Shortest tripping, three months, longest tripping, five months. There's four states I haven't seen. Hawaii, makes sense, kind of hard by car. Um, <laughs> South Dakota, which is a shame because I'd love to see the Badlands and Mount Rushmore. And then I don't know how I've missed Tennessee and Kentucky. <gasps> right? Road trip. <laughs> if I to make May, I might be able to take like a day or two off. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> we'll go. We'll go to uh, Memphis. Uh, Elvis. What's it called? Thank you. So, so through my husband's paranoia, I got to see this country and all its wonder and fabulousness. Stayed at a lot of national parks, and I'm currently a park ranger. Two of my boss and my colleague are here today, so we can tell you all about our park afterwards. You <laughs> should come to our programs. I said one of my future volunteers here. Uh, so Cedar Creek and Belgrave National Park. We're going to have a visitor center soon. A little plug. So, hello, welcome Patrick. Another one of my volunteers. So, thank you all for coming out. This is really, really special to me. Uh, especially now that I have a captive audience to show you all of my good stuff. So, I'm finally, after attending this school for many years and having a really good job, I was able to save up some money and finally lived my dream. And in August, or I'm sorry, yeah, in August of last year, I went ahead and I traveled for three months. And what I want to try to show you today are the three fundamental reasons of why traveling is so important. But first, I have a quote. I want to figure out how to use this thing. Uh, St. Augustine, the world is a book and those who do not travel read only a page. And I find that such an inspirational quote. And I often think of being in a library confined to four walls and all that knowledge, all that wonderful knowledge in books. It's kind of the same thing. If you don't leave that library, you can't go out there and experience what you learn from those books. Now to me, the reasons to travel is that, number one, it will change you. Number two, travel will absolutely blow the lid off of any stereotype you have of any other culture or society. And it also gives you this amazing uh, insight to become a better American citizen and ultimately a better global citizen. Now, 
determining how to travel, there's so many different ways to go ahead and do that. And as I mentioned before, this is going to sound like an ad for Rick Steves. Uh, for those of you who don't know Rick Steves, he has a show on PBS, Your Through the Back Door. Amazing. Now, I love him because he fits for me. His whole thing is teaching people how to travel independently. And he's got tons of tours. I did the 21-day tour of Europe. Oops, wrong one. Um, but he offers week tours, city tours, country tours, wine tours, anything you could possibly like. Uh, and again, back to the technology, he has this wonderful app, which I did use, because in certain locations that maybe I unexpectedly found myself in, <coughs> didn't have anything planned, I might have had an app for it, so I was able to listen to Rick tell me all about Prague as I walked through it. It's really awesome. Technology is amazing. I can plug for our park again. We have a battle app. <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, now, when I started making the plans, I've got this wonderful map of the world behind us. That's, of course, focused on Europe. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. Uh, focused on Europe. Where do I want to go? Eastern, Western? What about the cultural and language barriers? What about the food? So I started planning everything. I was like, oh, I want to go to Greece. And of course, Greece is falling apart. Is that safe? Um, Iceland, oh, I really want to get there. And then I'm so mad, I forgot my one book, my one book uh, about this, this hike. It's called the Camino de Santiago. And it goes from southwest France to northwest Spain. And it's this old thousand year Christian pilgrimage. And I was like, ooh, they say it takes about five weeks. I said, well, I always wanted to do the Appalachian Trail, but that's about six months. Five weeks definitely sounds much more doable. So the Camino, ooh, fun. And then I'm at work two years ago at the Hutzel Civil War Park down in Strasbourg giving a program. And uh, I met this guy from Switzerland. I thought in the valley that I'd meet international people, like we didn't learn from the last panel, right? Um, Lorenz, Lorenz Deegan from Switzerland, he was an avid, avid traveler. Uh, he's a train enthusiast. People with hobbies are really weird. <laughs> you have noticed. Um, so, Lorenz and I started talking. It turned out he was visiting a family outside of Richmond, and it was when one of those hurricanes came through, and they had no power, so they came to the valley for refuge and stumbled upon my program. And I was lucky because they were the only ones there, and guys didn't know I like to talk. <laughs> and I talked and I talked and I talked. The next thing I know they're inviting me to meet them for happy hour after work. And I was just starting to plan this trip. And Renz was like, oh, you have to come stay with my family in Switzerland. So we exchanged information. And I thought, geez, I wonder what that means. We'll get to that in a second. <laughs> so, oops. <laughs> so uh, ultimately, I ended up choosing the 21-day <coughs> tour for Europe. I figured that was a good way to kind of get my feet wet and learn how to travel. Signed up, found my air ticket, got my URL pass two months. Figured three months traveling with a group should teach me what I need to know if Rick Steves stands by his word to teach me how to travel independently. So I get myself from Dulles to Amsterdam, and I keep going the wrong way, sorry. And boy, after an all-night flight, landing in a foreign city, thank goodness most of the world speaks English. <laughs> I was pretty jet-lagged, but I found my way from the, hotel, or from the airport, taking the metro, whatever their metro is called, made my way to this little town called Harlem, although it's larger than Winchester, so I guess it would call it a little town. Found my hotel, it's about 9 o'clock in the morning, thinking, oh my god, are they going to have my room? Desk guy was really nice, he said, we can have it for you in an hour. So I started roaming the streets and I found some breakfast and went back to the hotel and didn't know what to do with myself. I was so tired but so excited. I'm finally, I'm here, I'm in Europe. But I knew through one of these books that there was a jazz club 
actually there was a bar that did a jazz night on Thursday nights and Sunday nights. And I love jazz. Sometimes I almost think that jazz is the best gift America ever gave the rest of the world. <laughs> so I did take a nap. Let's see if I do this the right way. And I made it to this little bar. Now let me tell you, the Dutch got our music. I love it. Susan, though, she's been there. So <laughs> these people were having it. <laughs> and they thought, well, who's that young girl? What is she doing in art? Because it was the kind of bar that these guys come out to every week. I was so tired, but I had so much fun, and I thought, wow, if this is what Europe is, I'm going to love it. And I did. I totally loved it. So, another day to myself to roam around. I went to Amsterdam, just trying to get a feel for what it would be like traveling on my own, but knowing I would have the safety net of a tour to start the next day. And uh, the 21 tour day uh, was great. We went, started in Amsterdam. We went to this little uh, town called Arnhem where they had this open air market. I caught a lot of great ideas. If you guys didn't know, again, I'm a park ranger here at Cedar Creek and Belgrave National Park. Um, and we're developing a visitor center. And I was just kind of like, ideas, ideas, ideas. So this lovely village where they have all of the history of Holland homes and their agriculture. It's really cool town called Bacharach, Germany, which we're going to talk about in a moment, Rotenburg, a uh, lovely medieval village, Dachau, I'll talk about in a moment, Austria, Italy, wow, uh, Switzerland, <coughs> France, and that's just the 21 days with the group. I had nine more weeks past that, so absolutely amazing. This is the first day of the tour, and this is my friend Kathy, the crazy Canadian. She was the only Canadian on the tour. And this is what I love about travel. You just never know what you're going to learn. And never did I think I'd learn about the Canadian educational system and how it works. But I did through, uh, through Kathy. She was lucky, and I think we were both a little bit jealous of each other, because she was a lot more reserved and a lot more shy and a lot more quiet, where I'm very open. Um, and I think she sometimes thought, oh, I wish I could talk the way she does. But this woman had, had it good. She taught grade school, I think, or maybe middle school. And uh, in their system, she was able to take 20% of her income every year and put it into a savings account. So for five years, she saved a year's worth of pay, took a year off. <laughs> Boss? <laughs> so she was able to travel the world. And actually, I, I, as I was I have a Facebook page about this, inviting everybody to come, and Kathy's like, oh, I'm doing a hike today, and I'm like, well, where are you? Maui. <laughs> so this woman, I mean, she was very lucky that she had the system that she had. But what she and I did differently is that I did the three-week tour to learn how to travel alone, and then I went off on my own, and I kind of stumbled around. Or she did back-to-back -to -back tours. She might have had a few days. Um, not on a tour, but she had, she had every minute planned. See, and I didn't want to do that. I wanted the freedom to have life just kind of take me wherever. Uh, but that's what worked for her, and that's what she felt comfortable and safe. But it was funny because when we realized, oh, well, we should meet somewhere after the tour. Yeah, well, she was here, and I was here. And, <laughs> so, so, again, this talk is hopefully to help inspire you to go travel and to find what works for you. I mean, I'll say Rick Steves, Rick Steves, Rick Steves, but if it doesn't fit your personality, it's not going to work. So find whatever works for you. That's our bus. We were calling it the Green Hornet, the Green Lightning, the Heidelberg bus. I'm going to talk about Ronnie, the bus driver, in just a moment. Now, as I put this uh, talk together, I realize it's very history heavy. And I realize, well, it's because that's what I love. I love history. And uh, there's so many other things I love as well, but this was very special. We were in this little town in Germany called Bacharach on uh, the Rhine River. And this is Harry Young. And Harry Young was amazing. Um, for those who know the National Park Service, he's the European Ed Bars. He's just amazing. He was 14 years old when World War II ended. I wish I had recorded him because I had my glasses on. And I was crying the whole time. And those are the lessons that you just don't expect to feel so deeply. He talked about 
his first sight of an American, and he said, my first impression was that Americans had red hair, because a battle had just occurred, or a skirmish, or whatever it was, and he did see a young man slumped on a building, and he'd been mortally wounded, and it was blood. So, I, I can't portray Harry Young's emotions, but it was, as he talked, it was as if the day before he had only witnessed that. But there was hope with what he said, because he was talking about the aftermath of the war, and you know, he was the enemy, he was in charge. He said, but God bless the Americans, I love the Americans, without them, we never would have made it. So these are the kinds of wonderful things you can find in Europe, and relate back here as well. But it doesn't have to just be history, it could be anything that you're passionate about. You know, Harry Young, Jennifer was my guide on the Rick Steves tour. And the Rick Steves tour, Harry Young and this man Thomas are the local guides. That's what I love about this company is because not only do you have your main guide, but they bring the locals there to tell you about their culture. Now Thomas is an up and coming uh, uh, politician in this little town. We've become great friends. I'm such a social media junkie now because through meeting him, we talk all the time on Facebook. Um, Harry Young says when he retires at 100, Thomas can now start taking over his course. <laughs> so, oops, oops. so from Bakarov, we went to Rottenburg, the medieval village, and then we made our way to another really sad, sad location. Dachau concentration camp was actually a Nazi work camp, and I was told, oh, it's not as bad as those death camps. I do want to go to Auschwitz or one of the other ones one day just to feel the difference, but I don't know. I don't know. Um, some of uh, my tour members were the most avid ones with a the camera. They put their cameras away. And for some reason I was compelled to take this picture. And one of the uh, women looked at me and said, how could you do that? And I said, I don't know, maybe I can use it for teaching one day. I knew I'd be doing this. Um, has anybody here been to the Holocaust Museum in D.C.? Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Being there, though, it's even more. Oh, we'll move on. Oops. Ah, something brighter. <laughs> we made our way to Austria, but Austria was really just kind of a blip. It was a place to stay. In a hotel to say we were to say we were in that particular country because then we went right back into Germany and we toured some castles and I put this one up there because uh, by this point in the trip my, I was driving my tour members crazy because every day I'd wake up and go I'm so happy <laughs> and seriously when you look at the pictures you see I'm so happy but this is cool this is Neuschwanstein Castle and uh, uh, king Mad Louis, Mad Louis the King, or whatever his name was, built this. Uh, pardon? Ludwig. Ludwig. Uh, um, Wagner. Wagner. He loved Wagner, and it was kind of all built up to him. But what I think is cool to this, for this, in terms of America, is that Walt Disney based his Sleeping Beauty castle on this particular one. So, little history. Absolutely beautiful. Prost. That's Cheers in German. This is our wonderful group, and I've actually developed some really great friendships from the group, so another plus. I never thought I would be a tour group person. This independent over here, who needs people, right? But they were really a lot of fun. Diverse background. Um, our guy bought us the schnapps. And I don't mind a cocktail every now and then.
You know, it's funny how you do things with preconceived notions. I went to Europe. I didn't want to talk to an American. I only wanted to talk to Europeans. I see Americans every day, right? So I attached myself to Ronnie. Ronnie, tell me, tell me what it's like to be a European. Tell me what I need to know. I'm an independent female traveling alone. In America, taught to live in fear, and somebody's going to grab you, and it's bad. And yeah, there's a lot of reality to crap can happen in America. Well, what do I need to know about my safety in Europe? And I trusted this coming from a European. And Ronnie said to me, Shannon, the worst thing that could possibly happen to you, I should, I should say, the most likely thing that bad could happen to you would be pickpocketing in a tourist area. He said, chances of you being grabbed, being raped, having any kind of attack on you is so unlikely, you really don't have to worry. He said, pay attention. But I thought that was pretty powerful, um, how different it is here versus over in Western Europe. Let's talk Western, I don't know about Eastern Europe. And uh, that first night when I was at the bar at the jazz club, uh, I ended up talking to another young lady who had, was in her early 20s, and her dream had always been to come to America. And I thought, wow, good for you, and she did it. But it didn't work out so well. Young girl, okay, I can only imagine if I was 18, 19, 20, I was lucky, I had a little more resources for myself to travel, but she decided to do the Greyhound in America. Right? Like, we know that's not the way you travel here. <laughs> And she was supposed to do three months. I think she made it two and a half, maybe three weeks, and she was on a plane back home. She said, I don't know how you guys live like that. <laughs> and I thought, wow, okay, another interesting perspective, because they're so used to having public transportation that's safe and clean and reliable. And I felt really bad. I said, yeah, in America, you would have been better off renting a car. Just the little differences you learn as you go. That's my friend Ronnie. We're in San Marcos Piazza in Venice. This is Florence, and oh my goodness, the street performers. Hmm. Now, I like this guy because he was actually playing um, covers of a Cuban album I love, the Buena Vista Social Club. You guys familiar with that? PBS did this wonderful documentary on these Cubans. Again, here I am in Europe and listening to Cuban music. Um, I could have gone broke throwing euros into every musician I saw. He actually got a euro because he was that good. I really enjoyed him. But as I was going, now he did the Cuban, but as I was hearing music and really paying attention, it seemed that every street performer was playing um, my way, Frank Sinatra. <laughs> <laughs> and as I'm hearing it more and more, I'm like, oh, that's the theme of my trip. Good interpretive theme, boss? Yeah. My way. So. And then we head to Rome, and seriously, you walk out of the subway, and this is what you see. And again, I told you this is a very history-laden topic, or uh, program. This woman is my hero. My boss is, my, is the rock star of interpretation in the Park Service world, Eric Campbell. She is a rock star of interpretation in Rome. I can't fathom how you pull 2,000 years of Roman history together in three, four hours, but she did it. She did it in a way that made sense, that covered everything from the Roman times, the ancient times, to modern 20th century Rome. And she really got me because she said, Rome is a city that belongs to all. And she said, think back to when you're going through those early years of education. What do you learn about? You learn about Rome. Rome is in all of our bloods. Francesca gave us all the gift of Rome that day, and it was wonderful. Now, she was a local guide for us on the tour, but she does have her own tour company. So if you ever go to Rome, look now. <laughs> you need to see her. And then, of course, it's just fun to do the tour stuff, too. It's all about seeing your food back door, but here's the Trevi Fountain. So you throw three coins in for luck, for love, and to return to Rome. Uh, I definitely feel like I have the luck, and I think I'll return to Rome. Love is all within, so I think it worked for me. <laughs> Rome, and here's ancient Egypt. I was walking, and I just kind of did one of these, and I was like, wait, what is that? Egyptian hieroglyphs. I don't know why 
I never crossed that that would be that. I mean, there's a little story about anti-nucleopeptide, right? So again, all these hidden surprises when you're not realizing. And this is the balance between doing a lot of research and just letting things come to you. And it's always good to go into something prepared, and I feel that I was pretty well first, but there were so many things that unexpectedly stole the show. And then the tour ultimately made its way to Paris. My little 10-year-old girl inside of me was wondering, is it gonna live up to what I expect? Are those Parisians really gonna be the snobs that I've always heard them be? <coughs> what, what, what? What am I walking into? And I was excited and nervous and tears came in my eyes and I, I made it into this lovely city. And again, another bonus point to the Rick Steves company was my guy, Jennifer. Um, she spoke fluent French, she lived over there, she had been a chef in a previous career. And she said, you know, what you've got to understand are the differences between our cultures. Because that's the only way you can appreciate them and behave respectfully. Because they're very quiet culture. And most of you know me and you know I'm not quiet. And our tour group, let me tell you, we had, fun. We had, we had doors closed on us, we were so loud. So here we are going into the city. And Things that I never would have thought of to have been warned. You know, we walk into a store and what do we do? We're a very tactile culture. We pick things up and we, oh, how is this going to look on me? And, right, we do stuff like this. But in Europe, or in France, I should say, in Paris especially, you know, you're, you're, it's not customer service. I mean, you're, you're, you're honored if they'll talk to you. And you don't touch anything before you ask permission. So these were like good guidelines to be going into the city to understand. And they also tend to whisper and talk much quieter than they do. You know, granted, I'm in Paris and I'm in a lot of the tourist districts and a lot of tourists from everywhere. Um, so they're kind of more westernized, Americanized. When I got out into particular Bayou, and I'm going to talk about that story soon, um, I did walk into a place, and they were all talking like this. And none of them spoke English. But they got one of the customers did because I needed something. <laughs> so had I not had that guidance from my guide, I would have thought something was seriously wrong. So <coughs> just different cultures are so cool. Now, the tour ends. I took a few more days in Paris on my own, and then I had to figure out how to use the URL. No, nothing more nerve-wracking than getting on a train going from country to country and trying to figure out if you're doing it right, if you're going to end up in the right place. I was, my biggest fear was that I would get off at the wrong stop, and then, oh my god, what? So, some of you know I'm type A, and I do like to be organized, and. Uh, the day before I'm leaving for my next destination, I go to the train station because there's like five or six train stations and I wanted to make sure I was going to the right one and I wanted to make sure I had my reservation because I didn't want to miss my train and I had to get out of Paris and move on. Easy, easy. And I decided to head to Strasbourg, France because my great-great-grandfather came to the Alsace-Lorraine region. region. Um, so I wanted to go see my roots. But I really didn't plan it well because by the time the train got me there, it was like 6 or 7 o'clock at night, and then for me to head on to my next destination, I had to leave at 10 o'clock in the morning, so it was like, hi, Grandpa. <laughs> Didn't really get to see it, but I was starting to get my feet wet. And from there, I was heading off to Munich, which was not a planned trip. And I was smart enough to accidentally fall into it right as Oktoberfest was starting. I'm um, glad I left the day it started because that just would have been a lot to do on your own. But um, I was meeting uh, some friends and I went to the tourist information desk to say I need to get to this area and they showed me what subway I was going to have to do a transfer and so forth and so on. So I get to the subway, I follow the directions that he wrote, I get on the train, and at this point I'm staring, you know, like our metro in DC, staring at the little station, 
and I hear German staring, and I have no idea what's being said, and I'm looking, and I'm looking, and I'm looking, and then the doors close, and I kind of look around, and I realize I'm the only one standing on the train. And the train starts to move, and then the, if the old system, and it starts, you know, the, the letter or number it was, starts, and it goes to nothing, and I thought, oh, this isn't good. And my heart starts beating, and this is exactly what I'm terrified of. Oh my God, I'm all alone with this good. And then the train stops, but it's not at a platform. And I happened to be lucky enough that I was in the front car, and the conductor was on the other side. So I panicked. I run to them. And this poor woman, crazy person, me, ah! and the door flings open, and I hear in German, what? I'm assuming that's what she said. And I was like, speck in the English, speck in the English. And she's like, nine. And I'm like, oh. And I'm showing her what the guy wrote, and I'm like, and somehow we managed to communicate without words. And I got the impression she was telling me to calm down. <laughs> <laughs> and that if I just get off at the next stop and follow these directions, I'll be okay. What it was that kind of once they were doing a, uh, like a transfer of conductors. So I was in the nether worlds of the metro system. And uh, then she gets out and starts walking away. I'm thinking, oh my god, did I, did I not understand her? Oh my god, so I go to the door now and I'm trying to open and get out because I'm in a panic. I'm, I'm, I'm really freaking out at this point. And I'm thinking, oh my god, she didn't relax. She's not going to leave you here to die. You know? <laughs> it's funny the things that your brain, brain conjures up. And probably 45 seconds later, which felt like 45 minutes later, I hear at the other end the train door shut and everything comes. Not that the lights had gone out, but the little flicky thinking came back on, and boy, I've never been so happy to get off the platform <laughs> in my life. Um, which then led me into uh, Munich. Now the next picture is the next day, but it still looks, still felt good. <laughs> right? You needed that beer. <laughs> yeah, not that I like to drink. I'm Italian. The beer over there is mm, inexpensive and tasty. So, it was fun to be in Munich. Um, as I said, I left the day that the festivities actually started, and I can only imagine the insanity. So maybe if I had been with a group of friends, but on my own, I was happy to leave. So from there, as I mentioned, I met my friend Lorenz uh, here at Hubsville Civil War Park, and he invites me to his world. Now, all right, so some guy I've never met from Switzerland says, yeah, come stay with me and my family. What, what, what does that mean? Do I stay for a day or two, or what do I impose myself on him? So we're talking by email, and I was like, okay. So Lorenzo, I'll just plan on a day or two, and he's like, no, you come stay with us for a week, and then we've got a holiday apartment, and you just stay with us forever. Okay, how do you pass that up? Now, initially, I'd been trying to do that Camino de Santiago, that five-week thing, but I thought, you know, how do you pass up two free weeks in Switzerland, one of the most expensive, expensive countries in Europe? So, I didn't do the Spain trip, but I ended up staying with Lorenz and his cousin Michael. Now, I mentioned he was really into trains. I saw a lot of trains when I was in Switzerland. Um, this is my first gondola ride. I've truly felt Swiss. Just a fabulous place. Green. You know the, uh, the commercial, happy cows come from California. <laughs> happy cows come from Switzerland. A Swiss picnic. I mean, really. They have wood cut. You just take what you want. It's free. Love it. Beautiful. Ate fabulously. Drank good wine. This is mom and grandma. Maya and grandma. I spent an afternoon with the ladies, and uh, we went to a local art show, and went for a hike, and it was awesome. This is Dad. This is Franz. Franz knew how much I loved history, so he decided to take me to the birthplace of Switzerland. It's a little village called Rubli. We had to take two boats. <laughs> um, Franz would be so disappointed that I wouldn't be able to recount how Switzerland was born, but what I kind of remember was that these three guys from three different areas came together and told the Habsburgs to shove it, was essentially it. So, I mean, this family was so wonderful. 
And this is Franz and Maya and us in Lucerne. It's wonderful. So I leave my little safety net of the deacons and I'm off on my own again and I have to figure out where to head next. I had some sites picked, but I kind of thought that after I finished with them I'd want to go back to Italy, but for some reason, because we only spent a night, two nights in a hotel in Austria, I thought maybe I should go to Austria. So I had come across, through various research, this wonderful site called Airbnb. So let's see if I can figure this out. Uh, Airbnb is a site where people will rent rooms out of their homes, or maybe it'll show, um, or maybe just rent an entire apartment. And I thought, well, you know, I'm a good American. I figure if you're spending money, you're going to get quality, right? Because there's this other site called Couch Surfing, which I'm a little less inclined towards because it's free and couch surfing just sounds like something I would have done at 18, not at 36. <laughs> um, so, I don't know, $40 a night? Okay. All right, well, we'll see if the pictures are true. So, I ended up staying in this little town in Salzburg, or right outside of Salzburg. I had to take a bus ride. It was about 25 minutes. So, here I am in a German speaking region. Um, figuring out the bus system and get out. It's raining. It rain. I'll tell you what, you want to see the first thing I bought when I was in Harlem? Well, it's an umbrella. I thought I brought it. Never mind. I bought an umbrella, which thank goodness was the smartest purchase I made. Gertrude was my host. And she was amazing. And her family was amazing. She was divorced. She had four kids. Um, she actually had an American staying with her named Cam from Michigan because he was kind of like her, he, for room and board, he worked her Airbnb business. And this is where I really started appreciating being around Americans while abroad. Because you could start talking and bouncing ideas off and sharing perspectives of things that sounded or seemed different. And the one thing that Cam had said to me that really caught my attention was simply that the Austrians put first their natural resources and that their lakes, there, which there are plenty of, you can drink from. Just didn't drink. I can imagine drinking from a lake around here. Because they would rather forego things like gas powered whatever machines on their lakes to preserve the integrity of their water. So, God, I like these Austrians too. So here I am. I'm not going to bother because I have a feeling that it, it'll get all screwed up. But these are all the pictures of the room I ended up staying in. Nicer than any hotel. Nicer for me, for me personally, than staying in a youth hostel because a youth hostel, all you're doing is staying with other tourists, other travelers. Now, granted, you might be meeting somebody from Japan, and that's cool. But here I was staying with an Austrian family. Amazing. So from Austria, I went to, or I'm sorry, from Salzburg, I went to Vienna. And I did Airbnb again. And this time, instead of staying with, oh, your software. Oh, I forgot a story. I knew this was going to happen. Lots of stories to cover. Uh, this wonderful town, I ended up going to um, see a concert. And this was truly a tourist trap. But it was wonderful because I, it was the best of Brahms and or Mozart and Strauss. So, you know, every, every classical piece of music you would ever know was performed, and it just felt really good. But what I learned that night was that it's not just the ugly American tourist anymore. It's the ugly Western tourist. Because in front of me, I had a, Span I had a Spanish family behind me. Well, it's not really Western, but I had Russians. Next to me, I had an Italian woman, and as I keep saying, I don't know what was at the end of the row, but she was an American, you can tell by the way she was dressed. Um, the Spanish and the Russians would not shut up. The Italian would not stop texting. And the one at the end kept getting up and taking pictures, even though the usher kept yelling her to stop. <laughs> and I was like, good, it's not just us. <laughs> <laughs> so, except for that, the performance was amazing. But, and then I headed to, okay, I have to skip something. Austria, or to um, Vienna. And I did the Airbnb again, 
and this time I ended up just staying with four roommates. So I said I kind of went from the Cosby show to Friends. Mm -hmm. And again, such a wonderful experience, because here I am, staying in these people's homes. And they invited me, they were having a dinner, I walked into a dinner party, and they're like, oh, we're having friends over, you can stay, or we'll tell you wherever you want to go, like, what do you want to do? And I'm like, I want to party with you guys. <laughs> it was awesome, it was awesome, and you know what? Very similar with their conversations, you know, they were all in their mid-late 20s, talking about their careers, their relationships. Uh, after enough wine and beer had been consumed, they actually pulled out vinyl records and the Bee Gees were played. <laughs> so, not different in all aspects. Then I made my way to Prague, and Prague was definitely on a must-see list. And for me, Prague was the most foreign land I had been to. The language was definitely very different. And what you saw me before was the Lenin Wall. And this is actually a clip that I took from, from one of the Rick Steves sites. And it talks about how these Czech freedom lovers found inspiration at this graffiti covered wall. Of course, they were behind communism, so they would whitewash it every day, but this graffiti kept springing up. And it's this constant, evolving, changing, beautiful wall dedicated to the peace of Don Lennon. Found it very inspirational. They were playing my way. I had to take the picture. <laughs> this is in Prague, too. Communist Museum. Really interesting getting the Eastern European perspective on communism. And I made my way to Berlin. And this is where I started really feeling at home. I'm German Irish. And I didn't realize what that meant until I went to Germany and I went to Ireland. This is on a four hour walking tour of Berlin, and this is Caroline, another amazing guide. Berlin Walks, got it from a Rick Steves book. Her grandfather was part of the SS. She talked about the shame of Germany. Um, how her parents' generation didn't learn from the unification of Germany in 1870 something. We didn't learn any of the 20th century history. We don't want to talk about World War I. We don't want to talk about World War II. She said, my generation is the first that's learning how to deal with the shame of Germany. From there, after this tour, I went to some museum called the Topography of Terror that was all about the Gestapo and the SS. And I found it really wild how, while I deal with talks regarding slavery in America, and how 150 years later, after the Emancipation Proclamation, we still can't come to terms with our shame over slavery. But yet, how much Germany is doing to work on their history and to learn from the mistakes of the past. So again, part of the reason why travel is so important is to understand why we are who we are in today's society. Brandenburg Gate, just a really cool art installation. I didn't see a sign, didn't know what it was, just thought it was cool. After this really long day, burdensome, emotional day, with all this Gestapo and terror and horror, and I go to the Metro because I realize I'm tired and I need to go back to the hotel and I'm just kind of sitting there lost in thought and I hear somebody talk next to me. I'm sitting down on a bench in the train station. And once again, I look up and I go, speck and see English? He says, I am talking to you in English. <laughs> <laughs> Oops, what'd you say? This is my friend Peter. He is from um, Holland. I love him. <laughs> he is what I aspire to be. This man realized about 10 or 12 years, sorry, Eric, this is what I aspire what to be. <laughs> 10 or 12 years ago, he said the desk world is not for him. And he now takes seasonal positions and spends the rest of the year traveling, either on the back of a bicycle or the back of a, motor a motorcycle. This guy is awesome. So we became friends and hung out for the next two days before we parted ways. And this is us. It's in the palace in Berlin. I don't remember the name of the palace because it actually wasn't that impressive. Go figure, right? <laughs> so again, back to history. This is the Jewish Museum in Berlin. It's an amazing art installation. Uh, they have these rooms called the voids. And I did, maybe, 
Now, I was in there alone. And I didn't realize you could do this. And let's see, the battery dying? Uh, get the keyboard. The keyboard works. Just pick it up. And you can pick it up and take it with you. Oh. I didn't realize you should walk across them to get a feel.
for Mitt Romney to say bye-bye, and I had to leave to go meet the tour. What was so cool was that when I started talking to the, to the Irish, they were so happy that Obama won, which I just thought was kind of cool because what do I know about Ireland politics? But I'll tell you what, the world knows our politics. So it's really cool things. And again, how sweet. So many people did ask how Sandy affected my family and my loved ones. And again, an American. This is Emily, who was on the Belfast tour. She's from Sacramento. We're now really good friends on Facebook. So this is up in a, this was a, um, a mall. Beautiful, open to have an overlook of the city. It's very cool. And this was our guy, Dominic, and this is what I really wanted to see, the wall. Now, having been in Berlin, I saw a lot of the Berlin Wall, the Berlin Wall Museum. This is the wall in Belfast, and I had no idea that this is closed every night at 10.30. I'm so, I, I know very little about the politics. I know the 70s were bad. He did a great job at explaining it all, but it just showed me how much I didn't understand the politics the Irish, the British, Protestants, the Catholics. So one more thing in my to read list. And then at this point, I'd been to two doctors, and I still didn't have permission to fly home because the fear was that my eardrum might burst and what to do. So I ferried from Ireland down to Cherbourg, France, and made my way to Bayou. This is Normandy, so back in the history. Of course, the D-Day invasions, this was the British Cemetery. I've called this with light, there is hope. This is the German Cemetery. Very dark and very somber. Um, Christian Cross, the Iron Cross. It's just all supposed to be very low key. The markers just had the name of the dead, their birth date and their death date. They, they didn't mark what rank they were because they didn't want any SS to be identified and desecrated. Because once again, this is war. These are somebody's sons, brothers, husbands, lovers. Very poignant. This mound, the dead and the unknown names. So then I'm at the Normandy Beach. This was my guy, Francis. Great interpretive technique. I wish we had seen. Uh, he did. He drew out how the invasion was. He talked about everybody seeing Saving Private, Saving Private Ryan. Um, I asked him because I know he guides a lot of Americans, a lot of veterans, and I said, "What do they think of this movie? Accurate, you know, movies and memory?" And he said that the veterans say that the first 20 minutes is so spot on. The only thing missing is the smell. The smells. Uh, amazing. Folks, I ended up here on Veterans Day, not intentionally. People had asked me what was the highlight of the trip. Every moment of this trip was the highlight, but this was the most special, I would say. I was asked, as part of the American Contingent, after they asked if there were any veterans, which there were none, um, to be part of the flag folding ceremony. So they played taps, they're lowering the flag, I'm crying. Just never know where travel will bring you. I really didn't talk about the food, did I? <laughs> Boy, I ate. Boy, I ate. So I'm in a town called Can, C A E N, maybe 10 or 12 miles away from the shore. And all I wanted were the mussels. I told great things about the mussels. I'm in this village, or city, excuse me, and I'm like looking at the menus, and I can't find any. So finally I just chose a place because I was starving, and I asked the uh, server, and he said, no, we're too far away from the shore. 10, 12 miles, guys. So remember the next time you're a red lobster eating lobster, how far? The French would think that was disgusting. But local uh, filet of beef, camembert sauce, and treats, and local wine. Delicious. The food overall was absolutely amazing. So the, uh, the the town I was staying in was Bayou, wonderful hotel. Uh, the gentleman actually got me into his doctor because at this point I need to fly home soon. Am I allowed to fly? I need to start coming up with a contingency plan. So 
again, the German in me is now coming out because I just needed to know I could go home. Not that I wanted to leave, but I needed to come home. My visa was going to expire. I had to go back to work. I had to come back to school. So um, I'm walking down the street. I've got a good sense of direction, and I don't see the place that the guy had led me to. So I finally just walked in across the street, went into what looked like maybe an insurance office. I scanned the room, and I looked for the most maternal figure. And I said, bonjour, madame. Parlez-vous anglais? No. And I show her again the address. And she, she gets up, and she starts talking to me in rapid French. <laughs> and I'm going, oh. <laughs> so she, she shows me her little ticket, and she said, and I can tell she's telling me, I'll be real quick. So she runs in, I mean, she was the next in, out in 30 seconds. She grabs my arms, takes me to the parking lot, opens her car door, puts me in. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this could be interesting. She looks around the corner, I'm not that far, but I'm thinking, I know I was on the right street. But she takes me to this medical building, and again, she's pulling me in. Uh, I did get her name, her name was Nadine. Uh, there's a quick exchange, and it turns out, no, we were in the wrong building. I was on the right street. I just hadn't gone far enough down. She whips me back, drops me off. Merci, madame. Merci, madame. I'll tell you what. I will never, ever, ever tolerate anybody telling me that the French are an awful people because they shouldn't be nothing but kindness. And that doctor was amazing because he said, you're good. <laughs> Still a little inflamed, but you can fly. Have a great trip. So with this, I had to make one decision. I had some time. Do I head back to Paris or do I go back to Harlem, which was that lovely little village? And I, if I made it back to Harlem, that meant I could go back to the jazz club. And I went back to the jazz club and I saw the same people there and they remembered me and wanted to know how my three months were. And it was awesome. My very last day was a Sunday. I was flying out on Monday, November 18th, or whatever it was. And it's their holiday festival. And their Santa Claus is called Sinterklaas. And Sinterklaas comes from Spain through the canals on a boat. And his elves are all in blackface. And I really didn't understand what I was watching, but it was fun. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, here we go. All the belly guys. Yeah, it's fun. There are kids everywhere, and it's very similar to our craziness here. And, but then the Dutch and the Flemish and the, I just didn't understand what was going on. I ended up finding myself down an alley and ducked out. And I realized, I felt that I pretty much scoured Harlem, but I was somewhere I didn't know. So I look up and there's these great street signs everywhere. And it turns out that the end of the way was pointing me to the way of my next journey. And I don't know if you guys caught this, I mentioned it a couple times during the trip, but there is a portion of the trip I missed in Spain the Camino de Santiago. The last sign I see the day before I fly out mm. is the sign, the only one I saw, paid attention to the whole trip, the Santiago de Compostela, 2,300 kilometers away. And I thought, I'm ready to go home. And with that, folks, I'm about 10 minutes over my time. I appreciate you <laughs> hanging out. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. I do have a lot of goodies to look at if you want to find out. I brought my map that actually shows the route I took. So again, you guys are my friends. So